Well, this is a topic which I'm, I rarely talking about, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, I've been married to this diagnosis for quite some time. It's uh, one of the major autoimmune disorders we, we treat, and it's very uh, treatable these days compared to what it used to be. So I think it's a dynamic story that I like to tell because I've been here long enough to see the whole thing evolve. Um, I initially trained when there's go to a clinic and we were passing out a few gold shots, Plaquenil, lots of aspirin, and very dose, small doses of prednisone. And that was the extent of our therapeutic armamentarium at that point in time. A lot's changed since then. Uh, so that's, we'll talk about this story and about this diagnosis a little bit. Uh, I'll just to define this diagnosis, first of all, these are some big words, but basically it's an illness that lasts. It's systemic, meaning it involves multiple body parts in addition to the joints, and it's inflammatory. Inflammation means pain, swelling, heat, stiffness, all those things that we don't like to see happen to our joints and other tissues. It's fairly symmetrical, usually in small joints predominantly, but it can be anywhere in the body. Uh, other organs are involved occasionally. Multi-system disease, multiple parts of the body. And I'll show you some examples of that. It's roughly between 2 and 3 percent of the population. Uh, it's common between age 35 and 45. The incidence in females is 3 to 1 over males. And it's predominantly seen in childbearing age group, predominantly. So it's a bad time to have arthritis. This diagnosis uh, hits its peak during those years. Uh, when it, later in life, the incidence between males and females equals out after the age of 65. This particular slide just simply points out the typical appearance of someone with rheumatoid arthritis, puffy wrists, puffy MCP joints. Interestingly, the fourth one's often spared. It's a common finding. We don't know why. But wrists, MCPs, PIP joints, PIP joints are less commonly involved, but they can be. As opposed to osteoarthritis, where it's largely the base of the thumb, the thumb, IP joint, the, P the PIPs, and the DIP joints. And for the most part, it spares the MCP joints most of the time. I can show you lots of exceptions to that rule. This is the distribution that we frequently see. In addition to these particular joints, it may in fact, sorry, may in fact uh, affect the larynx. The vocal cords are have a little small joint in there. Uh, the the cricoarytenoid joint can actually be inflamed. There's a synovial line there, and it can interfere with vocal cord function. That's not common. It can be in these sternocleidomastoid joints along the sternum, where the clavicle attaches the sternum on occasion. Of course, it can be in the hips as well. So, but this is the pattern, the kind of this is kind of a pattern recognition of rheumatoid arthritis that you learn as rheumatologists over the years. And this pattern holds up most of the time. Of course, individuals who have these so-called areas of inflammation outside of the joints, known as extra articular manifestations. There's a lot of things that can happen. This is take all day to talk about all these different things. But it's not unheard of in people that are, have positive blood tests who have a certain genetic predisposition. But in individuals who have both positive rheumatoid factor and positive CCP, which we'll talk about a bit later, are very prone to have these extra tissue manifestations. And their prognosis isn't quite as good in the past, but it's certainly better these days. So, poor outcomes. Lots of inflammation, elevated cell rates and CRPs. These are uh, protein reactions in the body that are measurable and reproducible and help us not, not only help us with the diagnosis of inflammation, but also monitor the clinical response to treatment. Some people with these positive studies called rheumatoid factor CCP and high cell rates 
multiple joints, early x-rays, erosion is going to happen as early as three months in some people. And if you're older and your immune system is a bit incompetent, and for some reason, if your economic and education status is poor, the outcomes are poor. That's been statistically proven for many times, for many years. I think that largely has to do with, in some respects, uh, uh, educational motivation and you know the means to deal with the disease and support systems that come with having the means to do so, I suppose. So what's the mortality rate? You know, some years ago, I can remember actually telling patients many years ago that there really wasn't a lot of difference in mortality until Dr. Ted Pincus, a rheumatologist at Vanderbilt University, published data which showed that the mortality rate is two to five times normal population, and it's equivalent to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We're all kind of familiar with that sort of condition, which these days, fortunately, is fairly treatable, but nevertheless, at the time that paper was published, that was the data. And that still holds true, but then we've learned a lot about why that is, and it has to do with this third item down here. People with this illness have many comorbidities, the inflammatory process stimulates vascular disease, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, the causes of the mortality include complications uh, as well, infections. The incidence of bacterial infections in rheumatoid arthritis, treated or untreated, is almost seven times abnormal. There's a higher incidence of lymphoma in people with rheumatoid arthritis, um, and that's been proven over the years. So statistically, that's no surprise, and gastrointestinal complications in large part, I suppose, because of certain inflammatory drugs that we use on occasion, although I don't think the instance of that complication causing death these days with the better treatment is very common. But there's some real clear evidence, and multiple studies have been published and, and uh, over the years, in the last 10, 15 years, about the fact that inflammation affects a lot of things. It makes diabetes worse, it makes your lungs worse, and all these vessels in your heart, as well as the heart itself, can be affected and made worse by an inflammatory process. In fact, they're looking at monoclonal antibodies and reduction in, in vascular disease using some of the same treatments now that we use to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Our product's very similar to that. But this is, the, this is the real issue. Uncontrolled, untreated inflammatory arthritis triggers a lot of these things and makes them worse. This is a criteria list. I don't want you to memorize this. We'll have a test later. Uh, if, but anyway, the bottom line is these are the criteria we use these days to uh, and I'll look at how probable that diagnosis based on the presentation. Just certain things are more important. More small joints, positive tests, duration of the persistent joint swelling, and inflammation. So the physical exam is a big part of it. In fact, you don't need positive tests to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. What you need are documented persistent swollen joints in a pattern that suggests rheumatoid arthritis. And you can have one joint involved in your body and have rheumatoid arthritis. It happens. It's not common. It can be in the most common side of the knee. Uh, I've been monitoring a lady for many years that's only had it in one elbow. But she has a positive blood test in one elbow. Fortunately, she responds pretty well to treatment. But it happens. We just have to keep our eyes and ears open. You worried about deformities, and of course, I kind of look at this from the pre and post biological era patient. People that are post biological era aren't going to have this happen. I just don't see it happening to my patients. This is called boutonniere deformity, and they're putting a little flower through that. The, the tendons fall off the sides and pull this together and create this little hyperextension of this, uh, or the flexion of the PIP joint and hyperextension of the VIP joint. Swan neck deformity, on the other hand, uh, quite the opposite. So you can have both. Or deviation is drift of the fingers at the MP joint level. Many people have seen that. A lot of cock-up toes out there. 
doesn't have to have room twice right so pocket toes a lot of times it's hereditary and the, and the ankle tends to shift out laterally and collapse medially. This is a radiographic hallmark of rheumatoid arthritis. This is called a marginal erosion and symmetrical joint space tearing. You see those things in combination. There's very little else on this planet that does that. Progressive, loss of bone cartilage, bone surface here, and this is the so-called radical erosion, mouse bite, if you will. But loss of cartilage space, see how it's getting narrower here and then here, to there to there to there. So that's the hallmark of rheumatoid arthritis in ready dress. A lot of things that we see, Baker cysts or, uh, or popliteal cysts come down into the leg and act a little bit like uh, deep venous thrombosis or blood clots occasionally. And the differential with an ultrasound is helpful if I find a Baker cyst. Back there, it's uh, very likely to be from that. Uh, the uh, inflammation when they happen to rupture can be severe extremely uncomfortable. Um, one of the presenting uh, signs of, of symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis is carpal tunnel syndrome. I can't tell you how many people have had carpal tunnel surgery before I get to see them and finally diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. It's a very common presenting symptom. It can be subtle and the swelling can be subtle. Today with physical exam and awareness and the see with ultrasound we can see sort of uh, inflammatory fluid and tissue and these tendons around the wrist or the carpal tunnel is makes it a little bit more easily diagnosed early on fortunate period. This is rare, a C12 subluxation. This is the top of your spine between the first and second, so called anto alanto axial articulation of the neck. Um, some years ago, I first in Lincoln I had numerous individuals going in for cervical fusion procedures to stabilize this, otherwise uh, the, the, the spinal cord is in jeopardy of being injured if they happen to fall and have an injury, or it may just happen anyway slowly over time and people develop uh, what we call it myelopathy, their spinal cord is you know, compromised and they have symptoms of weakness and numbness. Uh, not too long ago, one of my patients who I've been taking care of for years, again a pre-biological era patient, called up one day and said, my hands are numb. And I guess somewhere back in my mind, I thought, I better check her neck x-rays. Lo and behold, she had extreme subluxation or instability at this level, and we're dealing with that now. So it's less common now than it used to be because we just don't have this people developing this degree of arthritis uh, without treatment, fortunately. This is a very common syndrome. We see 50% of people with rheumatoid arthritis have some element of Sjogren's like symptoms, dry eyes, dry mouth, and sometimes if the salivary glands are enlarged, that kind of rounds out the, the syndrome for us. Uh, there's, so that's the syndrome. There's a Sjogren's disease. It's a sort of independent and separate, if you will, from rheumatoid arthritis, but many of the manifestations are very similar to rheumatoid arthritis. So, so distinguishing the two kind of depends on what the overall presentation might represent. And if there's real dry eyes, they're very red. You don't want that to happen. So some of the things that we look for that are kind of unique from this disease, and I do again point out that this is a, a multiple organ system disorder. We see these nodules and pressure points, most commonly the elbows, sometimes the Achilles tendon, even on ears, the butt, you name it, or this pressure, these little granulomous nodules appear in the skin. They make people worry because they wonder if it's a tumor or cancer, but they can be biopsied and they're histologically very, very unique. And uh, usually uh, we can easily identify them as being rheumatoid nodules without any problems. Inflammation of the skin or at the male, nail folds can cause little black spots. That's a benign, but it's part of rheumatoid arthritis. Inflammation of the eye, sclera, that's important because if they have that, it's, it's very threatening. It needs to be treated very aggressively. Without treating it appropriately, you can, the sclera thins and the eye can actually perforate. Never seen that, thank God. But I've seen plenty of people that have sclerotis, and we used to hit them with uh, everything but the kitchen sink to make that go away. He's a good ophthalmologist to help you with that. So there's lung disease, there's inflammation of the pleura, a heart sac, 
central nervous system vasculitis is rare, fortunately. More commonly, if someone has a, a stroke and there's or some sort of inflammatory, or something going on in the brain is something other than vasculitis. So you have to prove it one way or another. This is a peripheral nerve damage, one big nerve, get foot drop, foot or ankle drop, or wrist drop. And if you get one, one of those items, that's very threatening for life expectancy. If you get two, it's very bad. And then there's some skin lesions called peripheral, which are non-plantable red spots. It's an inflammatory skin condition that's part of this illness. So this kind of points out again that it's an interesting disease, it does more than damage joint. So how do you diagnose it? Well, number one is by far the most important, someone who knows what they're looking at, takes a good history and does a physical exam. These are confirmatory studies, again, inflammation markers, autoimmune markers, these are antibodies and proteins that we measure in the blood looking for signs of inflammation. The snowy fluid is very helpful. You can find some joint fluid with a fat it for the cell count. Make sure it isn't gout. I've had people come here who told me they had rheumatoid arthritis and long ago they had polyarticular gout. Uh, treated for gout for rheumatoid arthritis but yet had gouty arthritis. The x-rays help as I pointed out those images I showed you earlier of, of the joint disappearing and eroding. So one thing is true, if you have the appropriate physical findings and combine positive rheumatoid factor and positive CCP, there's a high chance that you have rheumatoid factor. It's 91% predictability when you have both these positive and it fits the clinical picture of this, what I call a slam dunk. This is what I do to take some fluid out of the knee. This is the femur found down here in this black area where water in the knee is. But quite easy. It's nice to have the pulse down so you know you're in the right spot and you can pull all the fluid out. Sometimes you put your needle in there and it's stuck in some cellular tissue and you wonder why that poisons the fluid coming out. So I can reposition the needle and make, make it happen. The fluid is cloudy, you can't read through it. This is non inflammatory fluid. You can see the letters on the other side of the fluid. This is typical of osteoarthritis fluid compared to the inflammatory fluid, which you might see in rheumatoid arthritis. The same cloudy fluid can be seen in psoriatic arthritis, gouty arthritis, calcium pyrophosphate related arthritis, which is pseudo-gout, or infectious arthritis. So you want to take a look at it. And it's, not, it's very important sometimes to culture that fluid to make sure that it's not an infected joint, particularly when someone has very active disease. I think it's important to recognize, and we've learned this over the years. Some years ago, we used to sort of sit around and do nothing for a year and say it's going to go away the bulk of the time. It's not really true. Uh, I can quote the North American Clinics of America that said that. I still save the article because it's historically wrong. Like most things in medicine, what you learned in the medical school is long gone. Everything changes over time. But this early part of the illness is when we want to treat it. We can clearly show that if you do that early on, you have a real impact on what's going to happen. So, one of the things that's important is this, this slide actually basically is a little bit complicated, but when people have early disease, and you catch it early, the impact of treatment is very, very significant. Uh, so this is very early versus late early, if you will. And the clinical responses, um, are very obviously uh, better if you catch it early. These are nice responses. You can get a 35% uh, ACR 70. That means 77% proven in joint count, set rate, CRP, morning stiffness, all the health assessment questionnaires we do. That's huge, 35%, 70% improvement. I'm not happy with the 20%. That's common. This is what they have to have in terms of FDA approval of a new drug is, is an adequate 20% improvement. But in my mind, if you're not 50% better, you're not good enough, we'll try something else. So it's important to notice that if you catch it early, these yellow bars are a whole lot better than the green bars. You want to catch it. The late early doesn't respond as well as the very early in the yellow. So the yellow versus green, you want it to be yellow. 
So what's the story behind CCP? Uh, we don't really know the cause, but there's an interesting phenomenon that we've been able to monitor. It's been quite a while now since we've known about CCP. It's a situated peptide that's actually made in the lung tissue, interestingly enough. And a lot of people running around with positive CCP tests who don't have any signs of inflammatory joint disease. But we do know one thing. Uh, you find this protein and a little enzyme in there that catalyzes this protein in the joint lining, the rheumatoid and all the tissue inside the joint. So there's some connection, clearly. Is that the cause? Well, it's obviously a little bit of an answer. Uh, it's nice to have some kind of link between a protein and the disease and what may be causing it. Studies are being done longitudinally to, to uh, look at people that have positive tests and see how, how many of them will actually turn out to have rheumatoid arthritis. The question is, do we start treating this blood test? Uh, we haven't come that far yet. But it's nice to know that we have a marker that's reliable in terms of diagnosis. And it seems to give us some insight into what might be generating some of the inflammatory process. And here it is. My favorite picture, Mr. Marble Man. Well, smokers, the positive CCP. Again, my friend, Dr. Pincus, published this article. Nearly 60, 60 times greater risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis if you happen to be a smoker and have a positive CCP. It's huge. Um, that doesn't make it on the front page of any newspapers, unfortunately. So there's, there are genetic causes. But this uh, habit is detrimental to people that may be prone to have rheumatoid arthritis. This slide's a little fussy and complicated. But the point is, we have targets now. We treat inflammation by targeting various proteins. And these are a lot of the immune cells. These are dendritic cells, plasma cells, uh, various kinds of white cells, B cells. And T cells are lymphocytes or one of the white blood cells. And all these little guys are running around creating little proteins. And those are signal proteins. And they're the proteins that produce enzymes and other uh, signals that create uh, damage to the bone. One of them, uh, in fact, influences the osteoclast, which takes the bone away. And uh, we've learned that inhibiting that cell reduces the risk of, of erosions of the bone. But we've learned that these targets in the inflammatory scheme, these cytokines, if you inhibit them, reduces the chance of progressive <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis. And they're pretty well known that the anti-TNFs are uh, many, there are five of those on the clinical market. We have an IL-6 inhibitor, an IL-1 inhibitor, and we have IL-17 inhibitors now. They're all monoclonal proteins that inhibit and target these particular protein. So you get out the bombs early. You don't let the enemy get up and breathe. You hit it with anti-inflammatories, traditional DMARs, particularly not the Trexate, can be helpful. And you can use them in combination. Over time, that can be helpful. Uh, but tolerance isn't that great. Uh, it's difficult to keep people on all three of those drugs long term. Uh, biological these disease-modifying drugs are just those little cytokines I talked about. And fortunately, we don't need as much surgery. I haven't sent people for hand surgery in a long time. So I call these cruise missiles. They're very targeted. These are antibody structures that are created in, in cells, uh, animal cells, actually, among various ovary cells, if you will. And it, what they do is they clone them cloned animal cells that create a single protein that targets a single protein. So it's pretty amazing science. It's uh, revolutionized treatment room arthritis, and it's the same technology is used in cancer therapy. Optivo, or that, you've got to have seen that commercial. That's a monoclonal antibody that targets a certain protein which inhibits cancer. So there are many of those underway. So what about cortisone? Well, you know, cortisone's been around a long time. And I want to point out historically, this is the very first drug that was actually developed for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. That occurred in the 1940s by a couple of gentlemen at the Mayo Clinic. 
kind of put Mayo Clinic on the map of the medical facility as opposed to the surgical facility because Mayo Brothers were surgeons. That was the nature of that whole clinic for many years. But when this happened, uh, Dr. Kendall and Dr. Hench uh, put this on board, gave it to some patients at the Mayo, at St. Mary's Hospital. They were bedridden rheumatoids who were dancing in the hallways so very quickly. And it was, you know, like a miracle. All that information developed the produce of the Nobel Prize in 1950 for those gentlemen. So it's an amazing drug. The next really terribly effective drug was the Tannercept some 50 years later in the 90s. So it took a long time to get a new drug for rheumatoid arthritis in all those years. So what do we do these days? Well, most rheumatologists here and around the country, around the world, will make the diagnosis early and start this drug early. Give it a couple, three, four months, see how, how things are going. And if it's not doing well enough alone, we add other products. You want to get on board with enough medication to keep this from causing radiographic progression. Within three to six months, you can see bone erosions on MRI scans. You may not see them on plain x-rays quite that soon, but the MRI evidence is clear. Um, so if you do methotrexate by itself, a reasonably good chance of controlling the pain inflammation as well, but it doesn't stop the radiographic progression by itself. I've, I've seen many examples of that. Um, the triple therapy, which has been actually uh, something that was um, kind of interesting uh, development. Dr. Odell at the Med Center in Omaha was actually one of my senior partner students many years ago, Dr. Art Weaver. In fact, he was hanging around the hallways when I first joined this group some years ago. So I, I don't take any credit for training him, but uh, he was uh, inspired by we were going to rheumatology, and that's where he wound up being at the Med Center. He's done a lot of uh, very interesting research. He has an organization called RAIN, Rheumatoid Arthritis Investigator Network. We've been involved with that over the years and helped and deal some, do some of the work that led to this idea of combining these products and using them simultaneously. And you can see a fairly good response and it's sustainable over at least two years. The clinical trials have been published. If you do one at a time, the response rate is less. All three drugs work out a little bit better with this uh, line. But again, there's a slow, slow, slow decline in response over time and uh, retention of treating people that in years uh, on all three drugs is hard. So if you use TNF inhibitors um, and combined with methotrexate, that's Enbrel, Remicade, Humara, Symphony, Simzia, uh, this is the response you expect to see. There's a 70% improvement, 20%, 50% improvement, 40, and 20% improvement, and 60%. So bottom line is you'd like to be up here in the 50 or 70 percent if possible. According to the American College of Rheumatology guidelines, if you don't see at least uh, this degree of improvement, it's probably not good enough. Well, this is a Batocept. I'd just like to show you a few individual things. This Batocept is uh, Orencia. Uh, it's, a, it's a T cell inhibitor, one of the white cells, and that inhibiting its function uh, T cell function a little bit improves matters considerably. So with placebo plus methotrexate, you're green. You throw a batocept in, and you're quite a bit better. Uh, ACR response of 29% at 70. ACR 70 at 29%. And that's sustainable. And interestingly enough, over time, uh, it's, it's, its sustainability and its function over long haul have been proven to be quite effective. Rituxan is a B cell inhibitor. It's another one of the white cells, lymphocytes it's called. And there are a particular set of B cells called CD19 and CD20. You can actually measure them, and in the clinical trials we've done, those are measured to see what the clinical response might be. Um, the people that are not adequately respond to methotrexate alone, uh, Rituxan will do very well. You can tell that the placebo patients 
in uh, blue just that tricks they aren't doing so well and over time we'll see that's a very significant response combining it with uh, the toxin that As a rule, we tend to use that drug later in the scheme of things, and FDA has only approved the Tuxman for people who fail TNF therapies. Um, now this is a product that you're probably familiar with. It's called Ectemra, and this one's an interleukin-6 inhibitor, one of those uh, little cytokines, those little messenger proteins that's being created by that cellular gamish that I showed you earlier. And you use this in combination with methotrexate, you see pretty good responses, obviously. Um, it's interesting how some people respond to this when they don't, other things. You tend to use this as a backup to TNF inhibitors. You can use it first line if you wish. Uh, we do use it first line. I like to use it in juvenile polyarthritis patients because it really does a nice job. Again, it's a monoclonal protein targeting protein called interleukin-6. Now this has got a new kids on the block. These are oral and it's a thing called jack kinase inhibitors. Um, the interesting thing about this product is that it's oral and it does a reasonably good job again in affected enic responses. I think these percentages aren't quite as good as CNF inhibitors but they are, this drug is largely used in people that uh, for one reason or other, uh, haven't responded to TNF inhibitors. It's hard to get this approved by insurance companies right off the bat unless you've shown adequate failure of some of these other products that we've already talked about. But it's interesting drug because it kind of works upstream a little bit. It actually, instead of inhibiting those little proteins floating around uh, on, in the blood, in the serum, in the liquid part, or on the surface of cells, this actually goes has its function inside the cell. It kind of slows down the factor before those proteins are even made. So if you measure those proteins in the blood, you actually see less of them that's being uh, inhibited intracellularly as opposed to extracellularly. So these are the choices. Um, lots of things to think about when you're on my side of the fence. Lots of things for the patients to learn about, of course. Um, What's better? Well, among the TNFs, there's no head-to-head -head trials. We don't know if one's definitely better than another. We all kind of have our biases. I mean, I, I sort of have a personal bias for Enbrel. I've been around, I've used it as longer than any other drug out there. I was fortunate enough to be in a, involved with that drug in a clinical trial that lasted 15 years, uh, from phase two on. And, you know, when patients came back and said, what is this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna mortgage your house and bought all the stocks you could. And, it lives rather nicely these days. Uh, I would be in jail if I'd done that. But, uh, at any rate, uh, you know those products all work, and I've I've had a chance to investigate all of them over the years, and I think they all have their place. Um, if you have a TNF failure, I tend to prefer using a drug with a different mode of action. Instead of a TNF inhibitor, go to a T cell or a B cell or IL six, whatever, and uh, use one of those. Uh, unfortunately, insurance companies have been largely driven by uh, people who review and mostly pharmacists and they seem to think that they have to try two or three TNF inhibitors before we can go on to these drugs. I read lots of caustic letters telling them that's not true. Uh, the, the general consensus is among rheumatologists is that it's not necessary to do that. Uh, you don't have to try more than one. There have been lots of studies looking at that subject. Um, but over time, I think most of the pathologists are starting to look at a different product, a product that has a different action, a different uh, target molecule. So if, if one thing's very true, if the TNF enters with methotrexate, it reduces joint damage much more effectively than methotrexate alone. Um, these are the, the two newer ones. This is a smaller molecule, and this is a longer acting molecule. This one you give once a month. Uh, this one gives, can be every sub here every two weeks or once a month uh, in the office, depending on his broad administration. Abatacep, uh, which is really important, is this is the one drug that's been tested head to head with Humira. This is Humira. 
and they're basically equal. But over time, abatacept has staying power. And so does rituximab. That's what's kind of cool about that drug. You hardly ever, ever see anybody fail either one of those drugs. And like Tamara, um, again, I use it a lot in younger people, and I use it as a second backup largely to TNF inhibitors. But I don't hesitate to move to a quickly as the right drug. And rituximab, we don't know, again, if whether it's any, we don't have any head to head trials. I largely use this in people that aren't adequately responding to other biological agents. If one thing's clear about this drug, the people that are seropositive and blood test positive rheumatoid factor and CCP are really good responders. Seronegative rheumatoid patients do not respond nearly as well. We don't quite understand why, but that's a fact. Most of the clinical trials, the drug companies that help design the uh, protocols that we were involved in uh, had, usually had a higher percentage. Of, they wanted a higher percentage of seropositive patients in their studies as opposed to seronegatives. Because they knew darn well that the seropositive patients were better responders and they wanted a drug to look good so they could get it passed by the FDA. It makes sense. You know, if it doesn't work. Uh, but I have many patients who are seronegative who respond well. Uh, but sometimes they're, they're frustrated because they can't quite find the right one as soon. And you can use this uh, last one called Zeljans with and without methotrexate. Uh, it can be used as monotherapy or you can find the two. And they don't, there may or may not be much difference. Uh, there's no one's actually proven that combining this with methotrexate necessarily is better than using it by itself. But most of the time we add it to this drug and this drug isn't working. And if we decide later on to withdraw this drug, we can and see what happens. But again, it's intracellular inside the cell, intracellular. That's unique and new. And it inhibits quite a few different proteins. Um, it doesn't inhibit TNF and IL-1 that much. But it inhibits IL-6 a lot. And one of the things about this drug is that we have to monitor it carefully uh, for um, lipid issues and liver dysfunction, as well as uh, low uh, lymphocyte counts, one of the white blood cells in our peripheral bloodstream. Well, what are the risks? Well, I, I have one thing to say about the risks of all this, these products collectively, and that is, first of all, there are risks, but life expectancy is clearly improved collectively. You take all these studies, throw them in a big hopper, and shake out the bottom. Uh, if you're using these products, you're going to have a better quality of life, better functionality, and live longer. No doubt about it. There are obviously some issues, but wait, that's why you have doctors monitoring you all the time. That's why you want to be well educated so you can report things when they're happening and not sit around and wait around, wait around for another day to let somebody know you have a problem. So, allergies are rare to these drugs. Uh, that's, of course, the same as suppressive. Is there a cancer risk of these drugs? Still not proven one way or another. Um, once in a while, we'll see uh, other autoimmune illnesses happen in the setting of uh, TNF inhibitors, and even psoriasis can be induced by some of the TNF inhibitors on occasion. That's again not very common. Uh, this uh, Temer product, again, as I mentioned, uh, we have to watch for these things. We do know that it's, it seems to be a signal that people that have diverticular disease seem to have issues with their diverticulum and there have been perforations reported in people taking this drug, diverticulum rupture. Again, I'm not sure I've ever seen a case of that, but it's been looked at. One of those signal things that people are aware of, watch for it, and put it in the balance when you decide what drugs to use. And then, of course, the jack kinases. is the only thing that's really shown a real increase in incidence of this drug is for softer shingles, and we're not quite sure why. Um, again, we watch the lipids, we watch liver function. Over, well, the slides about it's probably about more like nine to ten years at this time. Um, there have been reported cases of tumors and lymphoma, but the incidence is not higher than expected in the general population, and that's important to know. So what's the expectations? Well, 
the earlier you treat it and diagnose it, the better, bottom line. It's predictable. I can tell people I'm going to help them, and I can believe it and make them believe it. We have lots of options now, thank God. It's important to be educated and know what we're dealing with, both the doctor and the patient. We've seen the reduction in disability. You can expect, in large part, a fairly normal life because of time. And clearly, life expectancy is better. So we've come a long way. I can remember sitting in my office many years ago, and we were looked up at me and said, we're never going to get a cure for this stuff. And uh, this isn't a cure, but it certainly beats the heck out of what I used to be doing. It's made my life joyful, and I have happy patients the most part. And, uh, that's, that's been a really, it's been a God, a very, you know, God blessing. Very, God has blessed us with some really, really new and innovative treatments, which, fortunately, I can tell patients that any kind of luck we're going to make you a better person. Um, didn't talk about interleukin 17, but that product um, is on the market now as. Um, so Centex, the Novartis product, and it's been marketed for psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. And it probably was helpful in ankylosing spondylitis um, as well. Uh, clinical trials right away in that arena. Uh, it doesn't work well in rheumatoid As we, we've done studies in, with the drug in rheumatoid arthritis, it doesn't work as well. But it's a target for that set of inflammatory diseases. So we have that um, tool as well. Thank God, because the TNF inhibitors helped those diseases quite well. But before we had TNF inhibitors and Cosentex, uh, treating psoriatic arthritis was a miserable occupation to be in. It was much like rheumatoid arthritis was 20 years ago, and I didn't have the, any, of the, any of these drugs. So that's a blessing. I've seen some pretty miserable patients with psoriatic arthritis. It's a different mindset. Essentially, people have joint pain. They don't care about that so much. They want their skin to be better. And uh, so it's, it's an interesting uh, story. Uh, I've seen that over and over again. I've had a chance to work with a lot of those people in the last couple of years, helping this synthetic product get on the market and, and other products similar to it. And uh, you know, the skin is their worry, not their joints. They kind of ignore their sore feet. I want this rash to go away. It's not a, it's a miserable rash and it's visually apparent for them in society. So it's, it's much like having a form swollen hand. They don't want that to go away. They don't want to look bad. They don't hurt, care as much as they hurt as long as they get rid of the skin disease. 